first, I want to thank Patty for her information on our test before treat program and other CLL Society uh, resources. Um, I think all the speakers were incredible. Uh, uh, to Tammy and David, I mean, just to hear those stories and the importance of being a smart patient just drives home uh, why we push to be your own advocate and to have an expert on your team and to test before treat. So I'm extraordinarily grateful. And Dr. Ryan and uh, uh, Jacobs and Brian Hill, uh, just very grateful for what you had to say. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions. I mean, and uh, I wish we could get uh, to them all, but uh, we aren't uh, going to be able to. I'm going to start. There's always some non-testing questions, general questions. So let me ask you this. And we, we know this about watch and wait, uh, that it's generally advised. But can you, uh, and, and maybe um, uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs, you can take this because you address this area. Can you wait too long? Um, that used to be more of a problem in the old era. Is that still an issue? Can patients wait too long? Well, I think it's first appropriate to acknowledge that there, there are a fraction of patients that uh, will never need to go on treatment. Um, and, and I think it's those patients that really highlight uh, why I think, I, I know we keep saying watch and wait, I really like to push active surveillance, you know, uh, but active uh, observation. Uh, yeah. I think too, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I think that it's that patient group that, that really highlights why I think even with advances in therapy, active surveillance is always going to be a part of um, the management of, of, of CLL even with better uh, and easier treatments. You know, I've got a handful of patients in my practice that have been on, that were diagnosed young and have been on active surveillance for uh, over 20 years. So, so for some patients, the, the answer is, is no, there's never too long. Uh, but of course, if, if, um, if, if perhaps a, a patient is, is not being necessarily watched close enough or not uh, managed well, um, maybe they quit checking in with their oncologist or um, it, it is possible to let things get a bit uh, too far advanced than maybe they should have been uh, prior to starting treatment. And, and oftentimes that uh, just makes the initial phase of getting treatment started uh, harder and, and more likely to run into complications. But uh, I almost never see a, a case of CLL that, that, that just gets so advanced, um, particularly um, uh, cases that haven't been treated previously that, that, that we just can't you know, do anything about it. What I tell my patients is that the, the big, other than standardizing enrollment on CLL clinical trials, one of the big uh, benefits of having the IWCL criteria and, and what their goal is, is to maximize the amount of time that patients can be feeling good and not on treatment, but allow us to intervene at the point where uh, we can safely before, you know, we quote unquote, wait too long and before uh, some, some complications occur. And uh, Dr. Hill, uh, some of the data on this watch and wait was old comparisons that, uh, you know, Dr. Jacobs with chlorambus, so we have better medications now. Do you still think it applies with the great drugs that we have today? Great question. I, I think um, until we prove that earlier treatment is better than deferred therapy, we, we still will be in this Stan international standard approach of, of active observation uh, in the absence of a treatment indication. Um, but uh, since, since we're on the topic, I'll point out that the, the National Cancer Institute um, cooperative groups are running a, a, an early intervention trial for high-risk CLL. It's called Evolve CLL is the study. I'm involved in the um, uh, planning committee and on the, on the uh, one of the study chairs. And what we're essentially doing is taking patients who have certain high risk features of those molecular features that we talked about, like 17P deletion and others, and uh, performing a randomized study of venetoclax with the venetuzumab immediately or at the time of a treatment indication. 
And the, the primary sort of objective of this is to determine if people live longer by doing that. Um, so that's an over, what we call an primary endpoint being overall survival. Um, and it's gonna take a long time to answer this question, many years. Uh, but if we don't try, we'll never know if it's better to treat. I mean, most other cancers we treat at the time of diagnosis. Uh, there are ones, you know, low-risk prostate cancer is one where we don't always treat, but, but most things we do want to get, if we can get rid of them or largely get rid of them, it's probably better, especially for high-risk CLL, but we don't, we can't say that with certainty right now. Uh, Tammy, uh, let me ask you uh, about that. Um, you, like every patient, went on active observation or active surveillance or watch and wait or watch and worry. What Was that a shock to you when that happened? It actually was because, um, like Dr. Hill just said, most cancers you think um, patients get treated right away. When you're told to watch and wait and just, you know, basically go away and come back, you know, every month, every three months for blood work, um, it's very scary because you just think, yes, I should be getting treated, um, but they're telling me it's fine. So you just trust and uh, yeah, it's not the best feeling. <laughs> I get it, but it's not the best feeling at all. Let, let me ask you, because your story is very poignant about you know, getting FCR and having concerns about it. Um, what was your thinking about a second opinion and getting a second opinion early on? It sounds like you had an advocate who helped you arrange for that second opinion, but that was, you'd already been through five courses of FCR before that happened or several courses of FCR. So yeah. tell us about that process and what you, if you had to do it again or what you would advise a fellow CLL patient in those circumstances. So as far as um, getting a second opinion sooner. So yeah. I actually thought about this quite a bit. Um, and I often say, um, you don't know what you don't know. So when I first got diagnosed, I was sent to a hematologist. Um, I never could have imagined that I'd end up going or needing a second opinion, which ultimately saved my life. Now, as a patient, you assume that you're going to get the best care. People are afraid to question their doctor. In my case, I had started asking specifically about being tested for 17P deletion. Um, at that time, I didn't quite fully know what that meant. I do now. But every time I asked, he said it was not necessarily uh, not necessary. Um, he would we would worry about that later on if and when I relapsed. I trusted him. Um, I trusted the system. I went through five months of chemotherapy until I went for a second opinion. Finally, um, now I did have the opportunity to go for a second opinion after my third treatment, but I wasn't feeling well um, because of the chemotherapy, and truthfully, I was scared and I was very hesitant. Now, looking back, I wish I would have gone sooner, um, but didn't fully realize the importance of advocating for yourself and the testing that should, have, that should always take place um, before starting treatment. It's so very important. Let me follow up, and I'm going to ask you a tough question here, Dr. Jacobs, and I know that you will handle this with finesse and, uh, <laughs> and be politically correct in the answer here. But this is an issue. Patients assume the doctor in front of them is an expert. Uh, and that may be a, an oncologist who sees a lot of breast cancer and prostate and lung and colon cancer, but not really a lot of CLL. So talk to us about how a patient can figure out, do they have a CLL expert? And what do you advise? Because not every, there's not enough Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Hills and, you know, do, Dr. Birds and Pagels and Furmans and, you know, the to see every CLL patient. Sure. I, and, and I, I really first want to um, thank you all at the CLL Society, I think, for, for, for stressing the, the importance of if, if you're able to, if you have the resources to at least um, get a consultation with a, a, with a specialist, because it, it, it makes sense. And as I tell um, my patient, there. it's not that I claim to be smarter than their local oncologist. It's just I have the luxury to be at a large cancer center and, and focus in a, in a very specific field and even within lymphoma, focus on CLL specifically. And, you know, half, 
half the patients I see have their same diagnosis. So I get to, to, um, to research in, in a much smaller um, uh, field. And, 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 and I think how you can tactfully as a patient, um, you know, assess the situation of the oncologist that you're seeing, um, on, you know, the, the, the looking at the hospital uh, uh, website isn't always helpful because I feel like a lot of oncologists will list um, that they focus in, in a lot of different things, which is, I think, hard, hard to do. So I, I think just kind of asking the oncologist, uh, you, you know, what, what kind of, um, what, what their practice is, is made up of and, and uh, do they see uh, all types of cancers or, or just certain types? And do they have a research interest? Um, I think those are non-offensive ways to, to just engage an oncologist. Uh, one you know, kind of clue into a situation is it's almost impossible to have a, a small practice you know, um, that's, that's, that's not in a, a bigger cancer center you know, where, where you have, you know, true specialists, particularly in a hematologic malignancy, I would say, I mean, it's, 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 I'm sure possible to have a, somebody that focuses in breast cancer that's in a, uh, in a community clinic with, with just a handful of oncologists because breast cancer is so common, but, um, you know, I, I think you're not going to run into a scenario very often where you've got a quote unquote CLL expert that's, that's in a, a, a small oncology practice. Dr. Hill, did you want to add any uh, uh, color to that? Yeah, I would just say that, uh, prior, you know, community oncologists are in a very difficult position. Uh, they, as you point out, are trying to stay up to date with all of the rapid developments that happen in breast cancer and lung cancer and colon cancer. And, and those uh, are really rapidly changing fields. And then when you add into it uh, a disease like CLL, which, as you point out, they may only see a few patients a month, um, it's very difficult for them to stay up to date. And I think most, most community oncologists will acknowledge that and uh, welcome a, a second opinion um, and shouldn't feel like you're slighting them by, by asking for a second opinion in that case. Dr. Hill, I'm going to follow up with a comment you made, and in clinical trials are infamous among patients for the amount of bone marrow biopsies we get and imaging CT scans. Um, is, is there something a patient can do about that? Are they really all that necessary? Because if you, what we heard from you and Dr. Jacobs is that they're not that necessary in the average CLL patient. Um, so why do we need to do so many in clinical trials? And is there anything as patients we can do about that? Yeah, this is a good point uh, to, to raise, which is that anytime you're, you're doing a clinical research, you have competing you know, uh, interests. One is the study and the other is the patient. Now, as the physician treating the patient, our obligation is always to the patient. So if we are involved in a clinical uh, trial and we have uh, a patient on the study, um, we try to adhere to the protocol because if we deviate from the clinical research protocol too much, we you know, um, have internal uh, sort of processes that, that, right, that monitor that and, and we're um, expected to, to not sort of break the rules. Um, that being said, the, ultimately the patient on a clinical trial has the ultimate say in what they do or do not participate in. So one of the important things about clinical trials is you can always just take yourself off the clinical trial at any time. Um, and, you know, there are cases where you can, as a patient, refuse a test. Like if you've had three bone marrow biopsies and they've all been normal, and the clinical trial says you need a fourth bone marrow biopsy, you know, it's okay to refuse in those cases and, and not feel like you're uh, doing anything wrong, in my opinion. So I think it's a balance. There, there's um, part of this is helping to move the field forward. And when we get more data and more samples and more scans, yes, it, it helps us uh, learn more and, and 
push the field forward broadly in general. And we've all benefited from that. Um, in 2021, we're a lot further along than we were five years ago. And it's all because of clinical trials. So, so it's a competing interest, but I, I would still make sure that patients know that we want the best for them and, and it's okay to say no sometimes. Dr. Jacobs, you, I, I think you mentioned in passing measuring immune globulins. Um, and one of the patients asked a relatively sophisticated question. You know, you can measure the level of immune globulins, which is sort of the size of the army, but how good the army is and how well it's equipped is a whole other question. So is there a correlation between my immune globulins and my ability not to get pneumonia or not to get a sinus infection? Or, and I know that there are specific antibodies that the immunologists can measure against that. Um, and this, of course, is a big forefront of an issue now in the COVID uh, pandemic times. So can you help us understand what testing you think about in your patients and antibody levels? Um, and I may have some follow-ups on vaccine and stuff that people have asked, yeah. Sure, yeah, so um, I'm certainly no immunologist, so you might get a more nuanced answer uh, from someone that is, but in the cancer realm, you know, there is some, uh, I, I call it kind of loose uh, data, that we can use as a, as a resource if we want to try to help our patients out with recurrent infections by giving them IVIG replacement. And the data is actually looking more at serious infections, patients that were hospitalized uh, and found to have uh, I, I, IgG levels specifically uh, quantitatively, not necessarily qualitative testing, but quantitatively below a certain threshold, you often, often hear 500 as that threshold, um, that, that if they got monthly IVIG replacements, they ended up hospitalized with infections less um, when, when compared to control. So based on that, we, we have this option um, uh, to, to give patients IVIG with documented low um, IgG levels. And sometimes it depends on what the insurance company will let you get away with. Um, but uh, we certainly are, are expanding our use of IVIG beyond just patients that, that get hospitalized with infections. I have patients that are getting IVIG that um, you know, maybe have, have had FCR in, in their past and, and, and just got recurrent infections that weren't necessarily so serious that they were hospitalized. I have a patient currently that, that kept having recurrent uh, shingles, uh, for example, a lot of recurrent sinus infections um, and found benefit with replacement um, with, with IVIG. So uh, I tend to uh, stick to a quantitative analysis and, and um, I, I don't try to have my patients on lifelong IVIG replacement. I do try to ultimately uh, taper off. The studies looked at six months and stop. I, I do have patients that have ended up on for, for quite a bit longer uh, than that and a handful that are on uh, chronically. Um, so, um, it, it certainly though, uh, it, it's a conversation that you can have with your own, own, own oncologist. And if there is a situation maybe where quantitatively the, the numbers look okay, but infections are a problem, maybe, you know, talking with an immunologist and looking, uh, a bit, a bit deeper into, uh, some qualitative testing would be worth doing for sure. So the intravenous immune globulins are IVIG, and now there's some subcutaneous uh, uh, paths too that uh, people can do at home, which may be an advantage for a lot of people and may provide a more stable uh, level, I think is uh, a game changer for people with recurrent infections and how they can be used. It's a blood product, so it's in short supply, and so there's all kinds of issues around that, but I think it's interesting. Um, Tell me, um, I just, uh, there, another sophisticated question for you, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, somebody said that they had multiple clones of CLL. They were told that when they were diagnosed, because you talk, it's a monocle, that it, cancer is clonal disease, but they were told that they have multiple clones. So can you explain what, what that means? Yeah, um, so 
the um, cancer can, uh, in its um, genetic aberrations, either that are there at the beginning or might occur later, we call that clonal evolution. Uh, it's why we retest the fish prior to each line of therapy. So you can have, for example, the classic model is uh, a patient that did not have a 17P deletion uh, when they were first diagnosed, uh, maybe were treated with, with FCR at a younger age, and then ultimately relapsed and, and surprised they, they now um, have a 17P deletion. And it's, it's um, it, the, the, the thought about what, what has occurred is, is there was probably a very small amount of that, um, that clone, that specific clone that was kind of sub, sub, but below a detectable level. Uh, chemotherapy successfully treated the less resistant disease, but left that behind for that clone to become uh, dominant. Uh, and then um, and, and then kind of outcompete the other CLL clones that are there to become the dominant clone. So uh, a lot of times these fish analysis will give reports on, you know, this percentage of the CLL cells contain the, the deletion 13Q or, or 11Q or 17P. Um, uh, so that... I, even though we call it a monoclonal process, there is some variation and it just, it's just with all this uh, rapid um, di cell division that occurs and resistance to, to uh, the cells dying, uh, the natural mechanisms that, that prevent uh, DNA mutations from happening in our normal cells, you know, these are happening um, regularly in CLL patients, and you can have uh, certain clones that then take off, and depending on their competitive advantage, you know, they might become the dominant clone, and, it, and it's a dynamic uh, issue that changes over time. Dr. Hill, um, I, I like to get to the tougher questions first, so I got another tough one here. Um, there's been an argument that maybe with the targeted therapies working so well that we don't have to do prognostic and predictive testing. Um, and I just would, and I've heard different opinions on this. I'd like to get your take. Um, uh, if, you know, if chemo is off the, the, the map, yeah, no, nobody's going to get FCR, you know, or just a very small segment. Nobody should get BR. Um, why bother, you know, to know if they're 17P or TP53? Yeah, I think it's a fair, fair question. Uh, we do know that um, complex cytogenetics or 17P deletion does confer a, a, a higher risk of uh, treatments uh, fail, failing to, to maintain durable remissions or responses uh, with the targeted agents. So you could say, well, these are still the best we got, so let's just stick with them. Um, but I think it's useful to know at the beginning what you have, uh, particularly because down the road, if things change, you can then sort of look back and see again to Dr. Jacob's point about clonal evolution, um, knowing if something uh, progresses or changes in the future, is it really related to the original CLL? That's something that's important to know. Tammy, um, you mentioned that you had um, someone doing the research for you, and then you switched. And as we're hearing, CLL is complicated, and it isn't getting easier. You know, I mean, there's more and more stuff going on. So how does a patient who doesn't have a medical background, I mean, tell us about that transition for you, how you started to do research and become a sophisticated patient uh, because you weren't born knowing this. You know, I had it uh, when I was a patient, I was already a physician, so it was easier for me. But tell me about your experience on how you did that and, and started to do your own in house research in CLL. Okay, so it was my cousin, um, and he was instrumental in helping me find uh, all of the information I needed at the beginning. Um, so, one thing he suggested, and I suggest to everybody, is to stay off Google because that's just not where you get your information. Um, and then quite frankly, I just started to read up on everything. 
um, I needed through the CLL Society. Um, I get your newsletters, which are amazing. Um, so the alerts directly on your website, on your Facebook page. Um, I do look up information on patient power, which I think they post a lot of the stuff that comes from the CLL Society. And I do also look at the LLS and the LLSC. Um, but mainly- like LLSC I mean, is LLS Canada, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so mainly, honestly, like the CLL Society has everything I think that we need. Uh, well, thank, <laughs> thank you for that. And, and is that, tell us, some of that can be overwhelming a little bit. And one of the things that we always worry, and when I do these webinars and I have experts, is that some of this is going to go over people's heads, you know, and some of it. So I'm sure when you, it's like, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, we heard, how was that? <laughs> how did you become comfortable with this? Or was it just, you just kept going back until it got, tell us about that process to become comfortable with becoming more expert. I just um, looked up information that I needed. Um, I honestly don't really have an answer for that because again, my cousin kind of helped me um, weed out what I needed to know and what I didn't need to know. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how to answer that story. <laughs> No, okay, no, but that's extremely helpful, extremely helpful. Uh, Dr. Hill, you mentioned um, that, uh, and uh, Dr. Jacobs mentioned that, you know, pay attention to the hemoglobin and the platelets, maybe more than the white count. We always say there is no level of white count that demands treatment. It's symptoms that demand treatment. Um, what, uh, what are you looking for? Um, is there something a patient should worry about as a hemoglobin or platelet level? that gets your attention? Is the rate of change important, not just the number? Help a patient understand that. Yeah, certainly, you know, I think there is a tendency to watch the white blood cell count go up. It goes to 15 to 20 to 30, and that causes anxiety because it's accumulating. Um, in general, you know, I, we don't, in a typical patient, maybe in their 60s, let's say, I don't really see anemia developing until you really get into like the 100, 150, 200,000 range uh, on average, but it, it can happen sooner. Um, if you're starting to get up into the 70s, 80s, 100,000, and the hemoglobin is starting to drift down and you're starting to drift down more, even if it's still normal, I think that can be a sign that you're getting close, particularly if there's uh, fatigue or, or symptoms, which I would say is probably the most common symptom we uh, experience, you know, we hear from our patients is tired, fatigued. And then you look at the hemoglobin, you say, well, you know, it's, it's 11.5. It's not that bad, but you still feel really tired. So if it's starting to go down, the white count's still going up and you're getting more fatigued, that's, you might be getting right to that kind of point. And, and it's difficult. There's no, you know, one test we do and say, you have to be treated now. Uh, but that's the general trend that we start to see where it's probably time to start. And platelets? Similar thing, you know, platelets um, can have a little more fluctuation and variability. Um, platelets only live about 10 days, whereas red blood cells live three months. So you can see big swings in the platelets, but in general, you know, the line in the sand historically has been 100,000 or platelet count of 100. And, if you're under 100, you know, that's an indication to start treatment. But I've got plenty of people who are, you know, 105, 106, and then one day they're 99, and they say, well, let's check it again in a few months. And you can ride that oftentimes for many months before you, even a year or more before you actually, you know, really see a, a steady decline and to the point where you need to start treatment. Thank you. Do Dr. Jacobs, the... Um... Anemia is not uncommon in CLL, and um, there's different causes for it. Um, and I'm wondering if when you see anemia, um, what kind of workup you do, and if there's any workup you do for low platelets um, uh, above and beyond uh, just, you know, a blood count. Yeah, so in, in, in my section of the talk, I touched on this a little bit when we were discussing bone marrow biopsies, but if 
if I've been following a patient for a while and I've seen their lymphocyte count slowly trending up and, and their red cell count and or their platelet count slowly trending down and they're not a patient I'm going to put on a clinical trial um, and they eventually cross those you know thresholds that we have by, for the IWCLL criteria that either their hemoglobin you know drops below 10 or the platelet count consistently drops below 100 um, then, then I feel okay, go ahead, pull the trigger, start treatment on that patient. I don't necessarily need a bone marrow. I feel like I've got a good sense that it's the CLL progressing within the marrow that is leading to the cytopenias. Now, we're all- Cytopenias being low blood counts. Low, low yeah. counts, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so in, in other situations, though, where maybe- the lymphocyte count isn't necessarily that high or hasn't changed that much, um, but I see a sudden drop in one specific cell count, like the hemoglobin or like the platelet count, and, and it's profoundly different. And, and say you have a normal platelet count, but a very low hemoglobin or, or vice versa. And, and I don't know that CLL really explains what's going on, at least fully, um, and I want more information. That's where a bone marrow can be helpful because I can do a bone marrow aspiration, um, particularly if it's low platelets, um, that's, that's, that's kind of profoundly low. Uh, I can do a bone marrow aspiration, look in the bone marrow, see if there's, uh, if the bone marrow is packed with CLL, which can happen even in the setting of a low, a low lymphocyte count. You can be fooled and then you do the bone marrow and it's just full of CLL. And that explains the, the, the cytopenia. And of course, that would be an indication for treatment. But for example, if, if I look at somebody's marrow that with the platelet count of, of 25 and um, in a normal hemoglobin and the CL and the CLL in the bone marrow um, is not that significant, maybe only a, a, a small fraction of the cells they saw were, were CLL, uh, that would, um, to me, clue me in that there might be an immune-related event that's occurring. And it's the immune system that's attacking the platelets or the red cells. Um, uh, and, and, and that maybe steroids is something that could fix this instead of starting treatment um, for, for the CLL. Now, to be sure, there are higher rates of autoimmune, uh, low, low cell counts in patients with CLL. And, and if the prednisone or, or what other steroid is used doesn't fix the problem, you can, you can treat the CLL and that often will fix it. Or if it keeps coming back, without steroids on board, then you can treat the CLL. But, but if it is just an immune cytopenia, you can get away um, with, with trying steroids first if you don't wanna jump in uh, to the treatment. The only other thing to consider would be um, if the spleen's really big from the CLL, it can, it can kind of independently chew up uh, platelets or red cells. Thank you. Uh, we're, we got about five minutes left. Uh, Dr. Hill, you touched on MRD, and that's an important concept. So I'm going to throw a couple quick questions at you and hope for quick answers. Um, MRD versus complete remission. There's, there's some interesting papers out of ASH suggesting that measuring for MRD might be even more important than whether every node is shrunk back to normal. What's, what's your thought on that in the clinic? Uh, I know that in trials, that's being done more. Yeah, we, we know MRD uh, undetectable state is probably the most important determinant of, of remission status. And as you point out, if you have big lymph nodes and they shrink, but they're not small enough to be called normal, you're not in complete remission by traditional criteria. But I think the traditional criteria are a little outdated. And MRD measures, we can measure MRD in the blood, we can measure it in the bone marrow, but what about in the lymph nodes? Is that, is that something that could be important? Because, you know, CLL can proliferate in the lymph nodes. Is that part of the future? Is there any way to measure what's going on in your lymphatic system? Well, I think the hope is that, you know, with, with any tumor DNA, it's um, spilling into the blood. 
And it's really, I think, difficult to measure, you know, go around sampling a lot of lymph nodes. So I think probably the best we're going to get as a surrogate for lymph node minimal residual disease um, with current technologies is uh, circulating tumor DNA, which is what um, most of the most sensitive MRD tests measure. All right. And tell us just a little bit about the correlation between um, one of the questions was asked about is certain drugs seem to work better in certain compartments, some work better in the nodes, the bone marrow, the blood. Could you explain that a little bit and how that impacts MRD testing and where you have to do it? Yeah, I think that probably the BTK inhibitors work a little bit better in the nodes and venetoclax probably works a little bit better in the bone marrow is uh, the general impression. So you can start taking BTK inhibitor and have big lymph nodes and within a couple of days, they're really melted away, but the, the lymph, lymphocytes, the white blood cells spill into the blood for a period of time before they kind of go off to pasture. Um, whereas venetoclax does seem to kind of hammer away at the bone marrow pretty well. So uh, I'm going to ask everyone just for some final comments or advice um, that they would give to the patients. And I'm going to put Tammy on the spot first and see, uh, is there anything you would want to say to a fellow CLL patient or any advice you'd want to give it? And if you could keep it to 30 seconds to a minute, that would be Perfect. great. I can yeah. do it. <laughs> so first of all, advocate for yourself. Um, find a CLL specialist if you can. Um, if that's not possible, at least a doctor who will be open to discussing, uh, discussing options with you um, to get the best care. The CLL Society Expert Access Program sounds amazing. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help navigating through your journey. You are not alone. Um, there are people out there to help you navigate this craziness. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Dr. Jacobs? Yeah, Tammy uh, stole a lot of the good points, but um, I would I would just say you know this is a this is a cancer. This is your 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 life. It's it's worth uh, maybe a little bit of inconvenience to to get to a, a a scenario where maybe even just every once in a while you can check in with um, somebody that's just really interested in this disease that you have. And 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 um, and you can stay up to date with what's going on because it's it's just it's been a a great story in cancer about all the advances that have been made in in treating this disease and, and it's more to come. Dr. Hill, you get the final word. Yeah, I, I would echo both those points. Really, just advocate for yourself and seek out those who um, have a, a focus in this disease because it is complex. It changes every year. It's hard to stay up to date. And I would add that, you know, to remain optimistic because who could have predicted how far we've come? And the best treatment today is going to be upstaged by a better treatment tomorrow. Um, and uh, But it's important to have an expert on your team who has access. I would add that clinical trials are often the very best choice for people. Um, it has access to the new drugs and access to the expert care. And testing is critical. Um, testing at the beginning and repeat testing and monitoring as you're going through it are critical. So uh, thank you very much to all the participants. Um, and uh, we, we are extraordinarily grateful uh, to uh, the sponsors, Adaptive, uh, Genentech, Janssen, and Pharmacyclics. Um, uh, without their support, this wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, I want to thank to all of you who joined us uh, today. Um, and uh, I, again, a big thanks to our speakers uh, for their expertise. And, and it's not easy, um, Tammy will tell you, it's not easy as a patient to get up there and respond live. And, you know, Dr. Hill and Dr. Jacobs do this a lot, but, you know, to ask the <laughs> patient. So I'm extraordinarily grateful to Tammy for jumping in here and for David recording his talk. I mean, it's just, this isn't easy. So I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful for that. Thank you for um, inviting me. Thank you. So um, please, um, you, you need to complete our, our survey and provide us feedback. Without that, we don't know how to make these better, what to do, what, what are your unmet needs. 
On November the 1st, we have a real treat. Uh, we have a um, caregivers um, seminar. And this person who's speaking is a, a, a social worker who's done major research on the role of the caregivers, who in my opinion are the unsung heroes in CLL who do not get their appropriate moment in the spotlight. And this is, I've, I've heard her talk before and I went, I went out of my way to headhunt her to get her for this webinar. It's gonna be amazing. So please attend whether you're a caregiver or not, drag your caregiver to this session because it's really uh, gonna be important. That's November 1st. Um, and uh, uh, I just wanna thank you. The CLL Society has invested in your long life and please invest in the long life of the CLL Society by supporting our work. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, take care.